again. Welcome to your very first GED on video. If you have not done so already, please take this time to watch the mandatory instructional video, which will provide you with details and information on how to get started with the GED on platform. For this and all GED on videos, we will be utilizing the Kaplan GED Prep Plus 2020 book, which looks just like this. This book, alongside with the GED on videos, will provide you with the opportunity to practice the skills and concepts that you will utilize on the big test day. However, I did want to point out that the examples that we will be reviewing will not be the exact questions that you will find on the test. However, they are presented in a similar format. Nonetheless, the GED on platform is a great way for you to get started to have a successful GED test. Now, if you're ready, let's go ahead and get started. As a reminder, we will be utilizing the Kaplan GED Test Prep Plus 2020 book for this and all videos offered through the GED On platform. You can find links to below to purchase the book at your local store or online. Now, before we get into the actual curriculum itself, I did want to cover a little bit of information regarding the language arts tests on the GED. Okay, so the language arts GED test. The test itself is called Reasoning to Language Arts. Time-wise, it lasts approximately two and a half hours with a one 10 minute break between parts two and three. Now, within these two and a half hours, you will be answering roughly anywhere between 50 to 55 questions, which are gonna vary in type and form. Now, these questions are gonna be offered in the format of either multiple choice, fill in the blank, drag and drop, hotspot, short answer, and an extended response, which is going to require reading passages of up to 45 minutes. Now, as we advise in our intro video, we highly recommend that you take your GED language arts test immediately after completing this section in the book. That way, all of the information that you have gained is fresh in your mind and ultimately will hopefully lead you to have a successful test result by covering Unit 1, Reasoning Through Language Arts. We will start with Chapter 1, Interpreting Nonfiction and Informational Text. Um, chapter 1 will be covering Lessons 1 through 9, uh, which will start on page 60 of the Kaplan book. So let's go ahead and get started. Lesson 1, Main Ideas and Details. Writers use a variety of different methods, techniques, and word tools to capture their audience's attention. Action words, descriptive imagery, and climatic storytelling are often utilized to drive the writing piece's central message. Every writer has a message to get across in their writing. This message is also known as the main idea of the piece. Sometimes the main idea is stated directly or evidently but other times it must be figured out. Each paragraph has a main idea. To find the main idea of a passage with more than one paragraph, it's important to put together the ideas from all of the paragraphs together. Now, let's look at our first written example found on page 60. We will go ahead and read this passage together. The passage states, when I am reading a poem, I rarely feel alone in the room. The poet and I are together. It's as if the poet wrote a secret diary years ago. I am unlocking it as I sit alone and read. At times, I don't understand what a poem means. I just like the way it sounds or the strange images it provokes. The world is so peculiar in a poem. At the same time, it is so enticing. Sometimes I understand exactly as if the poet is whispering to me, as if we share the same experience. I must be fully concentrated on reading or I cannot enter the world of a poem. There are too many daily tasks to attend to, tasks that are very far removed from the magic and imagination involved in a poem. On a cold, snowy day, I cuddle up inside my apartment and read and read. Then I'm free to ride through the imagination of all those who came before me. 
Now that we have read the written example, let's focus on answering the questions. Which of the following statement expresses the main idea? Is it A, the writer has a love of poetry, or B, the writer cuddles up on cold days to read? Now, as a reminder, the main idea is the central message of any written piece of work. So which answer seems like it is the main idea of this entire written piece? If you selected A, the writer has a love of poetry, that is correct. We can see evidence of this in a couple of different sentences throughout the entire passage. For example, at times I don't understand what a poem means. I just like the way it sounds or the strange images it provokes. The world is so peculiar in a poem. At the same time, it is so enticing. From this particular statement, we understand that the writer loves poetry so much that they actually don't even have to understand what the poem is about in order to enjoy it. They receive so much more than po from poetry than just the central message in itself. We find further evidence of this in the second to last paragraph. There are too many daily tasks to attend to. Tasks are very far removed from the magic and imagination involved in a poem. While the writer does mention enjoying cuddling up to read on cold snowy days, this statement is only made once and it is not the central message or the main idea of the overall written piece. Now let's go ahead and move on to the backbone of any main idea. It's supporting details. While a main idea makes a statement on its own, supporting details act as additional enforcers of the key message. A writer explains the main idea of a passage with supporting details. Supporting details can include things such as facts, examples, descriptions, and specific pieces of information. When you read, it's important to identify the key details that support the main idea. This is incredibly helpful, uh, particularly for things that are a little bit more challenging to understand or to read. Um, you can kind of start seeing patterns of what the main idea is based on how much supporting detail is actually incorporated in, into each passage or each book or each paragraph. Turn to our previous example and search for details that support the main idea which as a reminder is that the writer has a love for poetry. Now the question states, which detail helps you understand the writer's main point? We have two options. Option A is that at times the writer does not understand a poem. Our option B is the writer feels poetry is filled with magic and imagination. So which one of these statements best supports that the writer has a love of poetry? In this case, the correct answer is B. The writer feels poetry is filled with magic and imagination. This can be found in the second to last paragraph where the writer specifically states, there are too many daily tasks to attend to tasks that are very far removed from the magic and imagination involved in a poem. So in this particular case, the supporting details are evident and they very much support our main idea. While it does state that there are times in which the writer does not understand what a poem means, this does not support the main idea that they have an actual love of poetry. Now that we have learned what a main idea is and its supporting details, let's go ahead and put those tools to practice in this one that is going to be found on page 61. At this time, please pause the video and read practice one. It's served it from Adrian's thread found on page 61. When you are ready to restart, click play. Now that we have read the practice one piece,
Let's answer the following questions. Question one asks, how does the author describe herself? So we are looking to finish the second half of that first started sentence. She feels as if she is dot, dot, dot. We have a couple of different options. Option A states, searching for a place to call home. B, doomed to stay in Oklahoma. C, tiredness of the sameness in her life. Or D, being shadowed by failure. In this particular case, the answer is searching for a place to call home. The author states this directly, or feeling this directly, excuse me, in the first two lines and in the last paragraph. Quote, and I am still moving, looking for a home. I don't know if I'll ever escape my tradition, my past. Let's move on to question two. Who do the Chickasaw believe are responsible for making them move? Our options are A, the priests, B, white people, C, themselves, or D, the gods. If you selected D, that is the correct answer. This is verified in the second sentence in the second paragraph, which states, it was ordained by the deities. Deity is a different or a synonym for God, and therefore we can deduce that the correct answer is D, the gods. You may now pause the video again to complete and review questions number three through five. Click play when you are ready to continue. Welcome back. We are now moving on to lesson two, restatement and summary. Sometimes it is challenging to remember things that you have read or heard, especially if it's word for word. Thus, it is often that we retell a story through our own interpretation. Restating an idea means that you are putting it into your own words. For example, a classmate may tell you that they did not enjoy the new teacher at the school. You might then tell a friend that your classmate said the new teacher was not good. Okay. So while the classmate did in fact tell you that they did not enjoy the teacher, you are restating that statement by then passing on the message that the teacher was not good. Now, this is a restatement. This is not necessarily fact. Summarizing, on the other hand, is the act of giving a brief statement of the main points or important facts and ideas. For example, a classmate asked you to describe last night's reading assignment. You certainly don't want to give all the details as that would take too long. However, you would summarize only the necessary information to provide to your classmate. Let's go ahead and take some time to look at the written example provided on page 62. Let's go ahead and read this passage together. In Canton, Ohio, we take our desserts seriously. There are two local candy stores that receive over 90% of the city's candy business, Heggie's and Baldwin's. Those who prefer Heggie's won't befriend anyone who buys their sweets at Baldwin's. My family has always patronized Heggie's. At the Heggie's factory, Gertie wraps by hand each large chocolate candy in clear cellophane wrap. She's in the back of the store with her hairnet, seated at a table with hundreds of chocolates. My favorite chocolates at Heggie's are the dark chocolate creams, peanut clusters, and caramels. Heggie's aficionados point out that their candy of choice is a larger size and therefore superior. Their rivalry runs deep at Easter, Hanukkah, Christmas, Thanksgiving, and all occasions. Baldwin's loyal followers claims its sweets are sweeter. It's a feeder for the best chocolate in town. Now that we have read example two, let's answer the presented question. How do people of Canton feel about chocolate candy? Given the information that we know, we have two options to choose from. We have option A, which is that they consider it a serious health issue. And we have option B, they feel it's important enough to take a stand on. 
select B, you are correct. As seen in the very first sentence in Canton, Ohio, residents take their desserts very seriously. There are no supporting details found in the paragraph for answer A, therefore it is incorrect. Now let's move on to the second question. Which of the following statements best summarizes the difference in opinion over candy? Is it A, some people prefer Heggie's candy because it's bigger, while others prefer Baldwin's because it's sweeter? Or B, people argue whether to buy Heggie's or Baldwin's candy for different holidays. Given the information found in the paragraph, the correct answer is A, some people prefer Heggie's candy because it's bigger, while others prefer Baldwin's because it's sweeter. You can find evidence of this in the first pair, or excuse me, the first sentence of the last paragraph. Now let's take what we've learned. Now that we have finished our second lesson, let's move on to practice two, found on page 63. For practice two, we ask that you kindly read excerpted from the Encyclopedia of Business Letters. Please take this time to pause the video and read the provided passage. It is found on page 65. When you are ready to restart, click play. Now that we have read the practice, Let's go ahead and answer some of the following questions. Question one, the problems that the writer mentions in the first paragraph and outlines in his letter include which of the following? A, receiving repairs the writer did not ask for. B, rude treatment. C, lack of proper paperwork. Or D, the premium price paid for the car. The correct answer is C, Lack of paperwork. As the writer discusses the problem, he states that he wants an itemized and a proper bill of sale. He does mention the premium price, which is choice D, but that price is the reason he inspects proper paperwork and is not a complaint in and of itself. Question two, how does the customer want done about the burning smell? Do they want the mechanic to find the cause of the smell? A, B, for the car to be repaired for your charge if the cause of the problem is discovered. C, a refund of the money that was paid to have the problem fixed. Or D, reimbursement for having the problem fixed by another dealer. The correct answer in this case is B, for the car to be repaired free of charge if the cause of the problem is discovered. This expectation is stated in the fifth paragraph of the letter. You can now pause the video to complete and review question three. Click play when you're ready to continue. Lesson three, application of ideas. When you apply ideas, you utilize information that is already stored in your memory in a different but similar situation. When applying ideas, it is important to ask yourself, how is this new situation just like the situation in the passage? For example, it's your friend's birthday and you know that they love hip hop music. When you go to the store to buy their birthday gift, you walk past the pop and classical music sections and head straight to the hip hop section. In this example, you are applying what you've learned about your friend to help you choose a birthday gift. So let's look at the application of ideas in our next example, example three. Please take this time to pause the video and read the provided example paragraph found on page 64. It starts with, when the delivery truck dot dot dot. Once you have completed the reading, please feel free to restart the video to answer the questions to follow. 
Let's start with the first question. Which of the following situations is mostly the situation that happened to the writer? We have two options. Option A states, buying groceries only to discover you brought someone else's bag home. Option B states, buying 11 boxes of the same pasta at the store. If you selected answer A, buying groceries only to discover you brought someone else's bag home, then you are correct. Option B is incorrect as the writer did not intentionally buy 11 copies of the book. Let's review the second question. If the writer attended an auction, she would be most likely to A, decide which item to bid on and how much she would bid, or B, get involved in the excitement and bid on many things. Given what we know about the writer, the correct answer is B. Get involved in the excitement and bid on many things. The writer states that she couldn't resist buying additional items when she was shopping online. Thus, if shopping excites her, then she may not have carefully chosen which book to buy her mother and had ordered that one, then option A would be correct. We have now finished our third lesson. So let's go ahead and proceed to practice three, which you will find on page 65. At this time, please pause the video and read practice three, inserted from making the most of your money. Again, it is found on page 65. When you are ready to restart, click play. Now that you have read the excerpt, let's review the following questions. Question one asks, according to the writer, becoming debt-free is a behavior most similar to A, overcoming a bad habit, B, learning a new trick, C, forgetting a friend's birthday, or D, setting a good example. If you chose A, overcoming a bad habit, then you are correct. The writer advises those trying to break free of credit card debt, stick with it until you're free. Probably a lesson for all of us to learn. Now let's look at question two. If you have five credit cards with high interest rates and no grace periods, how can you become debt free? Is it by paying your debt off slowly so that you have extra cash for necessities? Option A. B never use the credit cards, C, use them only when it is not convenient to carry cash, or D, cut up the four of the credit cards right away. The correct answer is B, never use the credit cards. The last paragraph implies that the author approves of using credit cards only once you have already gone out of debt, and then only for convenience. Thus, if you are in debt, you should stop using your credit cards right away. You may now pause the video to complete and review questions three and four. Click play when you are ready to continue. We are now moving on to lesson four, cause and effect. When one event or idea influences another, there is a cause and effect relationship. To determine the cause of an event, we need to answer the question, why did this happen? So let's go ahead and walk through the simple example of a cause and effect relationship. If we have a car and we forget to put gas in the car, the car will stall. In this particular example, the cause is going to be us forgetting to put gas in the car, and the effect will be that the car will not move or it will stop. Let's now look at a cause and effect relationship in a written paragraph. We'll go ahead and read it together. The passage states, he is deceptively sweet upon waking up and lets out a large yawn showing his thin pink puppy tongue. 
and is simultaneously letting out a high-pitched squeaking sound. Not two minutes later, he's eaten my favorite magazine and stuffed his entire head in the kitchen wastebasket to find a leftover turkey bone. The pup searches under the bed, on top of the dresser, and besides the nightstand for anything to chew. He's on a rampage in the morning. It's just his puppy nature. To calm him down, we head to the park for one hour of exercise with the other neighborhood dogs. Afterwards, he plays with his stuffed animal squeaky toy, sleeps for an hour, then finds his favorite bone. He lies down like an angel, chewing with contentment. Now that we have read the example, let's go ahead and answer the provided question. What causes the puppy's owners to take him to the park? Is it A, they like to see the other neighborhood dogs? Or B, the puppy is acting too wild and energetic? From the passage, we can assume that this puppy is very wild and energetic. So the correct answer is B. We can find evidence of this in the second paragraph towards the beginning, where it states that to calm him down, the parents or the pet parents head to the park for one hour of exercise with the other neighborhood dogs. Why is the puppy so wild and energetic? Is it because it is just the way a puppy is? Option A or B, he has a behavioral problem. The answer is A, it is just the way a puppy is. It looks like these puppy parents have figured out that that is just how puppies act and it can be seen as evident in the last sentence of the first paragraph. Quote, he's on a rampage in the morning. It's just his puppy nature. Let's look at question two. What effects does the activity in the park have on the puppy? Is it A, it calms and tires him out? Or B, it teaches him to obey his owner? Again, in this case, the answer is A, it calms and tires him out. We can see that stated again in the top of the second paragraph. Last question. Why does a walk in the park have a calming effect on the puppy? A, because the puppy enjoys seeing the other dogs. B, because the puppy gets plenty of exercise. In this case, the answer is B, because the puppy gets plenty of exercise, again found in the same statement of the second paragraph. At this time, please pause the video and read practice four, excerpted from The Depression, found on page 67. We will be using the red material to answer the following questions. When you are ready to restart, click play. Our first question states, according to the authors, why was the depression of the 1930s so important? A, it could have been prevented. B, it was a time of economic hardship. C, it affected nearly everyone. Or D, it was unforgettable. Given the large impact of the depression, the correct answer is C. It affected nearly everyone. This answer summarizes the meaning of the first two sentences of the passage. Our second question, according to the passage, which of the following was an effect of the depression? We have A, many people lost the mortgages on their homes. B, the stock market collapsed in October, 1929. C, Herbert Hoover was elected president, or D, the rich began to save too much of their money. The correct answer is A, many people lost the mortgages on their homes. The answer is stated in the first paragraph. While B and D are both mentioned as causes, not effects of the depression, 
Therefore, the correct answer is still A. You can now pause the video to complete and review questions three through five. Click play when you are ready to continue. Lesson five, compare and contrast. You're probably familiar with comparing and contrasting whenever you go shopping. You do this when you compare two or more offered items of the same kind, things such as cars, medicines, clothing, even food. Writers often compare to point out what is similar in contrast to point out what is different amongst ideas. Let's use the following example to practice comparing and contrasting. We first have a pencil versus a pen. If we compare the two, we know that they are both meant to be held and used to write with. But if we contrast the two, we know that a pencil comes with an eraser when a traditional pen does not. We also know that a pen dispenses ink while a pencil utilizes lead. Lastly, we know that a pencil requires sharpening to utilize it while a pen does not. Let's take these same skills and practice them while reading the provided example. You can read the provided example paragraph found on page 68. It starts with, in December, it seems everyone dot dot dot. You can go ahead and pause the video to read this passage and click play when you are ready to continue to the questions. Let's review the three questions on the screen, one at a time. From the reading, what would you say the writer is comparing and contrasting? We have A, methods of shopping, B, Christmas and Hanukkah. The similarities and differences between the two holidays are the focus of the discussion. The two methods of shopping are merely mentioned. So the correct answer in this particular question is B, Christmas and Hanukkah. Next question. What is one basis on which the writer compares the two? We have A, the time of the year celebrated, and B, kinds of meals served. The correct answer is A, which is supported in the passage by the discussion regarding the time of the winter solstice in the Northern Hemisphere, close to when each holiday is celebrated. And now for our last question, what is one basis on which the writer contrasts the two? Is it A, gift giving, or B, their histories? The correct answer is B. Now that we have completed these questions, let's go ahead and move on to practice five. At this time, please pause the video and read practice five, excerpted from the Diaries of the Westward Journey. This passage can be found on page 69. Once you have completed the reading the passage, go ahead and click play. Let's go ahead and review the provided questions about our passage. Question one. What did Mr. West do that allowed this group to join the wagon train? We have four options. A, make wagons for others. B, bring four fine oxen. C, offer milk to the children. Or D, leave some of his possessions behind. The correct answer is D, leave some of his possessions behind. The answer is found in the seventh and eighth lines of paragraph one. The second question states, what purpose did the cows serve? Was it A, they led the oxen through a rough terrain, B, they carried children when wagons were full, C, they provided milk and pulled wagons, or D, they provided food and replaced the miles? If you selected C, you are correct. They provided and pulled wagons. The cows gave milk all the way to the sink of the humble where they died, 
having acted as draught animals for several weeks after the oxen had perished. We can find our answer in that direct quote of the passage. Now, please feel free to pause the video to answer questions three through five. Click play when you're ready to continue. We're moving right along to lesson six, conclusions and generalizations. As a reader, you can draw a conclusion when you take pieces of information and put them together to figure out something that the writer has not directly said. A detective draws a conclusion when he looks at different pieces of evidence and figures out who committed a crime. Meanwhile, a doctor draws a conclusion when she can look at different symptoms and figure out what illness the patient has. Let's dive a little bit deeper into conclusions and generalizations by reading the following passage on example six. Thank you for sending your resume in response to our newspaper advertisement. We consider our company and especially our employees to be the best, and we wanna keep it that way. For that reason, we carefully review each resume that is sent to us. We want to ensure that our company and the new employee we hire are a perfect match. This process, of course, takes some time. We want to assure you that your resume is part of this process and will be reviewed. If we feel we have an opening that matches your qualifications, we will contact you. If you've not heard from us within 10 business days of the postmark of this notice, be assured that we will keep your resume on file for one year and review it when future openings arise. Answer the first provided question. If a job applicant has not heard from this company three weeks after reading this notice, what can she conclude? Given the context provided in the letter, it can be concluded that the correct answer is B she did not get the job that she applied for. The notice does say that the review process takes time. It also says that the company will contact the applicant if, if it feels that she matches the opening. Finally, if she doesn't hear from them within 10 business days, her resume will go on file. You can conclude that the review process takes about 10 business days, and if she hasn't been contacted in that time, she did not get the job. Let's look at the second question. What kind of notice can you conclude this is? The way that the notice is worded with no personal details leads us to believe that the correct answer is B, a form notice sent to all applicants. You can also use your knowledge of the real world and business form letters to conclude that this too is a form. Last question, what conclusion can you draw about the company's attitude? Is it A, it cares about its employees and their job satisfaction, or B, it cares only about profits and employee productivity? The fact that the company states not only that it considers its employees to be the best, but that it also takes time to communicate sincerely with potential employees lets you conclude that answer A is the correct answer. At this time, please pause the video and read Practice 6, excerpted from The Story of My Life. We will be using the red material to answer the questions to follow. When you have finished reading the passage, please click play. Now that you have read the excerpt, let's answer the following questions. What can you conclude about the writer's view of learning? Is it A, it was rewarding and one of life's joys? B, it is better with the strict teacher? C, it happens very slowly, if at all? Or D, it happens most often when you are alone? If you selected A, you are correct. It was rewarding and one of life's joys. This answer is found in the seventh and eighth lines of paragraph one. 
Next question. What conclusion can you draw about the writer's character? Is it A, self-centered and demanding, B, confused and searching, C, fearful and shy, or D, insightful and grateful? In this case, the correct answer is D. The writer is insightful and grateful. You can now take the time to pause the video and review and answer questions three to five. When you are ready to continue, please click play. Surprise, lesson six is a two-parter. The second part centers around conclusion and generalizations. A generalization is a broad statement about a group of people, objects, or things, or about a type of event. In the case of generalization, something that is true is taken from one specific case and that it is extended to every possible case. Generalizations can be valid and true if and when used properly. However, generalizations are too broad to apply to every member of a group and writers will acknowledge that there are exceptions. Faulty generalization is not equal to valid generalization. Writers sometimes make the mistake of drawing faulty generalizations based on too little information. Since a generalization is a broad statement, a valid generalization requires broad knowledge to justify it. Let's look at some examples. Writers sometimes make the mistake of drawing faulty generalizations based on too little information. A faulty generalization can be something along the lines of, some dogs bark at kids, so all dogs must dislike or fear children. Valid generalizations, on the other hand, provide a little bit of a different example. Since a generalization is a broad statement, a general, or excuse me, a valid generalization requires broad knowledge to justify it. Let's take a look at an example. Every breed of dog has four legs, so almost all dogs have four legs. At this time, please take a moment to pause the video and read practice 6.2, Opinion, Doubts About Global Warming. It can be found on page 73. When you are ready to continue, go ahead and click play. The first question of practice 6.2 is, what is a generalization that is made on paragraph three? We have four options. We have A, Shady Hollow has the coldest temperatures in the region. B, Global warming can only be valid if it predicts high temperatures. C, on the whole, temperatures are not rising. D, if children are taught a simpler theory, then a more complex theory should be set aside. The writer states that rising temperatures are quite simply not what is happening based on the cold temperatures of the day before. Thus, the correct answer in this case is C. On the whole, temperatures are not rising. Feel free to pause the video to complete and review questions two and three. Click play when you are ready to continue. All right, everyone, we're almost at the end. Now we are on lesson seven, word choice. Writers make careful decisions to select words that will impact their audience. Connotations, or words that invoke feelings or ideas, are used by writers to impact their audience. Connotations are often divided into three categories, positive, neutral, and negative. On this slide, you will see examples and their various connotations. Let's look at the very first line across the table. We have under positive, the word interested. A fellow connotation of this word, but in a neutral setting, would be questioning, while a negative connotation of the same word would be nosy. 
even though they all have similar meanings, they definitely express different feelings and thoughts within not only the reader, but the writer itself. Now, writers also utilize other types of language to emphasize their points. So let's go through each one of these. We have up first, figurative. Figurative language is used by writers to make their descriptions clearer or more vivid. Metaphors. Metaphors imply a comparison between two things, such as the quote, life is a journey. Three, similes. Similes are used to compare two things and use words such as like or as. Lastly, personification. Personification happens when a writer assigns human characteristics to an inanimate object. Let's look at a few examples of these word choices in example seven, found on page 74. Let's go ahead and read this passage together. If you look very carefully, you can find the island of Ascension on a map about midway between Angola in Africa and Brazil in South America. The South Atlantic Island has a population of about a thousand people and is home to an important GPS ground antenna and a British Air Force base. Its volcanic terrain greets visitors with forbidding aspect. Place names like Comfortless Cove indicate how rocky and uninviting Ascension Island may appear. Even so, with its dry subtropical weather, excellent sport fishing, and unique wildlife, this barren outpost attracts about a thousand each year. Let's take what we learned about the island to answer the question provided. What does personification in the third sentence suggest about a session island? Is it A, tourists are forbidden to visit the island, or B, the island doesn't look like a good place to visit? If you chose B, you are correct. The island doesn't look like a good place to visit. Examples of this can be found in their placings, uh, such as that of paragraph two, first sentence, Comfortless Cove. At this time, please pause the video and read practice seven, a cool new blanket found on page 76. Once you have completed reading the section, go ahead and click play. Now that you have read the passage, let's review question one. In paragraph two, what is compared to a dream? An electric blanket? The flexible hose used in the cool forder blanket? The cotton insinuating layers? Or the cool forder blanket? If you chose D, the cool forder blanket, you are correct. The first sentence of paragraph two tells you two things about the cool forder blanket, that it works like an electric blanket and that it feels like a dream. Feel free to pause the video to complete and review questions two through five. Go ahead and click play when you are ready to continue. We are at our second to last lesson. Lesson eight, writer's tone and point of view. A writer usually has a certain attitude toward the subject he or she is writing about. To determine tone, look at word choice and manner of expression and ask yourself, how would the writer sound reading this piece? This attitude is the tone of the piece. It is not directly stated and it must be sensed by the reader. On the other hand, the point of view of a piece is where the author is coming from. The writer's background and experiences may affect her or his opinions. Let's take a go at putting this lesson into practice by reading example eight. Let's go ahead and read this passage together. Watching actor Brian Dennehy as Willie Lowman in the state production of Death of a Salesman was transforming. I know intellectually that live theater is better than movies. Movie actors reshoot scenes until they're perfect. An actor on stage has one chance to get it right. It is immediate. 
The actors are breathing human beings in the same room with you. Theater provides the opportunity for strong emotions to surface right there in the moment. Seeing a play often envelops me in energy, but I've never gone so far as to cry at a theater performance until now. I cried because Denny Lohman reminded me of my father, of the brevity of our lives, of how easy it is to waste our lives. This was not an intellectual response. I suddenly heard what, what, what this man on stage was saying. His life wasn't worth living, though he had tried hard. He had a devoted wife and two sons. It didn't matter that this play was written in the 1940s. Mr. Denny stood on stage and roared at us about our lives now. It was hard-hitting emotional drama. Ooh, that was a lot to take in. Let's go ahead and try our best to answer the following two questions. Question one, which of the following best describes the tone of this piece? Is it positive and somewhat odd or B, cool and objective? Given the information provided in the passage, we can conclude that the right answer is A, positive and somewhat odd. Second question, what point of view does the writer of this review above have? Is it A, that of a person who prefers sitting at home watching TV, or B, that of an enthusiastic theater goer? The evidence shows that the correct answer is B, that of an enthusiastic theater goer. The evidence of this is shown in the second sentence of the paragraph. Now that we've completed these example questions, we can move on to practice eight. Please take this time to pause the video and read practice eight, excerpted from Talking Back to the Two. It can be found on page 77. Once you have completed the reading, go ahead and click play. Having now read the passage, let's go ahead and answer question one. Who are referred to as razor-tongued fanatics in uncensored statements? Ooh, that's a powerful statement. We have A, the television writers, B, the television cast of Big Brother, C, the internet writers, or D, the internet audiences. If you selected C, that is correct. The writer mentions internet sass and then goes on to say that you gotta love it because it keeps writers off the street and out of trouble. You may not pause the video to complete and review questions three through five. Click play when you're ready to continue to our final lesson. Woo! Lesson nine, text structure. You have already seen two text structures thus far, cause and effect and compare and contrast. But now let's take a look at a few more examples. Writers make choices about how to organize informational and nonfiction materials based on their purpose. There are other text structures that are often used for informational text. These include examples, pros and cons, chronological order or process, and elaboration. Let's go through one of these in more detail. If we look at pros and cons, which is the text structure, their purpose is to show benefits and drawbacks. We're directly comparing two different items. Some of their sample transitions are on the one hand or on the other hand. Elaboration, for example, Another text structure is meant to expand things with additional details. Some of their simple transitions are additionally, furthermore, and moreover. We're now gonna move on to our last example, the passage found in example nine. Let's read this last one together. Today, there are millions of workers who are not employees in the traditional sense. They are called contract workers. 
These are self-employed individuals who have contracts with different businesses. For example, a graphic artist may have several different clients and design a newsletter for one and a website for another. Contract workers pay for their own equipment, supplies, and benefits, such as health insurance. Our first question is, what is an example that explains the concept of contract workers? Is it A, they are not employees in the traditional sense, or B, they may have contracts with several businesses. In this case, the correct answer is B. They may have contracts with several businesses. While answer A makes sense, it does not explain what a contract worker is or the concept of one. Therefore, it is incorrect. All right, moving on to the home stretch. Practice nine. At this time, please pause the video and read practice nine, cough pots, small pots, and immunity. When you're ready to re-begin, click play. Ooh, we're almost there, everybody. Let's go ahead and answer this question one. What step in the process came before James's recovery from cowpox? Is it A, his immunity to smallpox, B, exposure to the cowpox disease, C, scientists' theory that cowpox and smallpox are similar, or D, Jenner exposing James to smallpox? As seen in the text, James's recovery from cowpox followed his exposure to it. Thus, the correct answer is B, exposure to cowpox disease. Note that choice D refers to Jenner exposing James to smallpox, not cowpox. Feel free to pause the video to complete and review questions three through five, or excuse me, two to five. Click play when you're ready to continue. Everyone, we made it through our first chapter of Unit 1. Great job. I know that was a long one. Um, this is one of the longer chapters in the book, but we are finally finished. Now that we have completed Chapter 1, you have to keep going. The next video will cover Unit 1, Reasoning Through Language Arts, Chapter 2, Analyzing Nonfiction and Informational Text. Best of luck.